I have to end. Okay. Good afternoon and welcome to the Health and Government Operations Committee. Um, we ask that folks not forward the Zoom link for hearings. Uh, staff will not allow anyone to testify who has not been invited into the hearing. I ask you to encourage folks to watch the hearing on YouTube. This today, we have a floor session beginning at uh, 5.30, so we have a hard stop, which means we are going to pay really close attention to our timing today. The bill sponsor or designee is allotted five minutes to present a bill, and then up to five witnesses will each be allowed to speak for two minutes in support. All of those witnesses should stay in the hearing until the delegates have had an opportunity to ask questions. Next, up to five witnesses will be allowed to speak for two minutes in opposition, and then we ask you to stay to respond to questions from the committee. Please conclude your remarks when you see the timer finish. Members must remain on camera um, during the entirety of the hearing. And members, we're gonna really be diligent about the one question and one response from a witness today because of our time constraints. If you have other questions or you need to follow up, please do it offline. Please use the raised hand function that indicates that you have a question. Um, I would ask also that when we're, when we're asking questions, we remember that our, question, that our questions should be shorter than the answer. We will, we will take a break, but the length of the break and when it occurs is going to rely heavily on uh, how we are moving through the bills because we would like to and need to complete this agenda by 515. So with that, um, we will begin our hearing today with House Bill 879. This is Maryland Emergency Management Agency, Cybersecurity Coordination and Operations Office Establishment. Uh, welcome, Delegate Watson. Good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Chair Pendergrass, Vice Chair, my dear friend, Melissa Bender, who used to work for Judiciary and left us. Uh, this is the second bill I'm presenting before this committee on behalf of the Joint Committee on Cyber, Biotech and Information Technology. Um, last year, the U.S. Cyberspace Solarium Commission released a report on behalf of the federal government. That bipartisan report clearly states a glaring issue with the way we approach the issue of cybersecurity in the United States. The commission reported that the US government is currently not designed to act with the speed and agility necessary to defend the country in cyberspace. We must get faster and smarter, improving the government's ability to organize concurrent, continuous, and collaborative efforts to build resistance and respond to cyber threats. The issue that were included in the report were not unique to the federal government. Maryland also faces the same issues and potentially to a greater degree, accompanied with a lower level of preparedness to face these looming threats. HB 879 seeks to address these issues by creating a cybersecurity coordination and operations office within the Maryland Emergency Management Agency. This agency would be responsible for improving local, regional, and statewide measures and providing much needed resources in order to maintain a high level of cybersecurity readiness. From handling tasks such as developing prevalent cyber disruption plans to coordinating provisions of technical services, this office will be able to, pro able to provide a regional and organizational approach to managing the risk of potential cybersecurity threats. As the old adage goes, an ounce of prevention is worth an ounce of care, and this bill, bill seeks to implement that ounce of prevention that's much needed in the state of Maryland. And for these reasons, I ask for a favorable report on HB 879. Thank, Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would like to invite the panel of favorable um, to speak and then we'll begin with Robert Day. Hello, Madam, Madam Chairwoman Pendergrass and Vice Chairwoman Pena Melnick and members of the committee, and thank you for the opportunity to testify in favor of HB 879. My name is Robert Day. I'm a council member for the city of College Park, a member of the Maryland Cybersecurity Council, 
and a senior management officer with a technology development firm, White Rook Technologies out of Columbia, Maryland. I've been in the information and technology uh, network security field for over 30 years. The threat of ransomware attacks has increased over the last few years with no sign of it slowing down. Since, nine, since 2016, about 48 states in the District of Columbia have had ransomware attacks wreak havoc on their police and fire departments, phone systems, email systems, and other services. In 2019, the known financial impact of the state and local governments, healthcare providers, universities, colleges, and school districts was well in excess of $7.5 billion. As the frequency of attacks continue to rise, many cities have suffered cyber attacks which have resulted in temporarily disabling many services, including those of fire, police, and 9-11 services for their localities. This has hit close to home with the Baltimore attack costing the city at least 18 million in recovery and lost revenue. Certainly there are cities and the counties across our state that are meeting the growing challenges of security modernization, innovation and leading edge applications. However, far many are living with serious deficiencies, both known and unknown. As a city council member for City College Park, I would like to think that we are on the cutting edge and ahead of the curve when it comes to technologies and network security. But from working in the field with a diverse clients of both commercial and federal, I know how fast things change and how quickly sophisticated hackers adapt. As an elected official, we must do our best to make sure to protect all of the valuable citizens information within our network. A, su a successful attack on our city would erode the public trust, would slow growth in our city and affect the willingness of many to take risk and try new endeavors, businesses or investment in our city. In 2019, the University of Maryland, Baltimore County nationwide server survey of cybersecurity in the US local governments stated that serious barriers to protect the cybersecurity lack of preparedness within these governments and funding for it, and that local governments as a whole do a poor job of managing their cybersecurity. Mr. Dam, I'm going to have to ask you to start wrapping up. And I, I <laughs> um, based on my experience with the IT infrastructure network in, in cybersecurity, I strongly support HB 879, and, and I know that this will boost our preparedness and readiness within our state. And I believe the objectives of this bill are necessary in developing a strong cybersecurity ecosystem within our state. And to the members of this committee, thank you for your time and the opportunity to give testimony here today. I encourage a favorable report of HB 879 and thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Bill George. Thank you uh, to the chair and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Bill George. I'm with the Maryland Municipal League here today in support of House Bill 879. Um, local governments currently are required to protect the personal data that they store uh, through the storage collection and, and disposal. Um, but, this, the, but the law allows for some flexibility in the types of um, protections that um, that are imposed uh, based on the type of data that is being stored. Um, this bill is uh, sets up a great framework in our estimation in that it builds upon that flexibility um, by doing a couple things uh, primarily. One is the um, assistance with the guidance and development of cybersecurity disruption plans, technical assistance to local governments to help implement uh, cybersecurity best practices. And as was mentioned earlier, uh, regional groups to help deliver um, support services when needed. Um, uh, with that, you know, we asked for a favorable report. Um, this is a, 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 the creation of the office will really allow for um, municipalities in particular to continue to customize the types of uh, protections uh, based off the information that they have on hand um, and the, uh, the resources provided by this new office would really go towards furthering the security that um, all of our municipalities can offer. So with that, we ask for a favorable report. Thanks. 
Thank you very much. Are there questions from the committee for this panel? Okay, no questions from the committee. All right, seeing no questions, thank you. That concludes the hearing on HB 879. I wanna thank uh, uh, Delegate Watson and the panel for your time and testimony today. Uh, and we will move to the next bill, which is bill um, 1276, Delegate Henson. This is Maryland Emergency Management Agency, Emergency Planning and Management Cultural Competency Study. Uh, Delegate Henson, welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. Am I allowed to share my screen? Uh, Melissa, what's... Yeah, hold on one second. Okay. Okay, Delegate, go for it. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the Health and Government Operations Committee. I am here to present House Bill 1276, Emergency Management Cultural Competence. When Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans in 2005, the city was thrown into crisis. The effects of displacement and destruction on the community that they experienced were lasting and brought to light the need for cultural competency training for first responders. Well, <laughs> whether it was um, its dietary restrictions, prayer needs, or cultural differences, the impact of the perceptions or the interactions every person has is different. For example, not all cultures react to pain the same way. While the experience of a person's pain is universal, the way they perceive, express, and control pain or, the, is, or those needs is learned behavior and it's manifested in culture. When 10,000 people were held in the Superdome for New Orleans, for instance, these diverse needs became more apparent. You'll ask yourself, what does that have to do with the state of Maryland? Well, in the state of Maryland, we have more and more extreme incidences of weather, including tropical storms, hurricanes, severe thunderstorms, tornadoes, nor'easters, blizzards, ice storms, floodings, droughts, and heat waves. The Chesapeake Bay is the third most vulnerable area in the state of Maryland to extreme weather. And if you give me just one second, I wanna make sure I power my device so that we don't lose the picture or our connection to each other. Um, the chances for natural disasters is high here in the state of Maryland. And an aspect of preparation that needs to be addressed in our planning for natural disasters is cultural competence. Uh, uh, I believe that the delegate will attempt to come back in. I think she just needs to power up her, um, uh, her technology. I am gonna ask if um, Claudia Barber, if you would be able to begin speak, you know, speak your testimony while we wait for the delegate to come back on. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I say good afternoon to the chair and vice chair of this uh, committee, the Health and Government Operations Committee. Uh, uh, the, I am speaking, my name is Claudia Barber and I am the first vice president of the Anne Arundel County chapter of the NAACP. I am speaking on behalf of the president, uh, President Jacqueline Olson. Uh, the Anne Arundel County NAACP wholeheartedly supports House Bill 1276. The bill authorizes the Maryland Emergency Management Agency, MEMA, to study and make recommendations on best practices and create model policies for emergency responders to follow in handling culturally sensitive minority communities in emergency management planning and practices. We ask that you issue a favorable report on this bill. The bill also includes having NEMA conduct a survey of state and local government organizations for emergency management to ascertain current emergency planning strategies that address the needs of diverse communities, including individuals with disabilities, American, Latino, indigenous, and other minority communities. We also applaud the bill's further mention of recommendations for model 
policies for individuals with limited English proficiency, individuals facing socioeconomic challenges, and individuals with religious restrictions. Finally, we endorse the requirement to review federal emergency management plans and the emergency management plans of other states that address the needs of diverse communities. Please vote yes for House Bill 1276. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barber. I understand Delegate Henson is back with us. So let's go back. We are all living in the new dependence on tech technology. So we appreciate your patience and persistence, Delegate. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. I apologize. I'll pick up where I left off with the committee's indulgence. Thank you. Cultural competence is defined as the ability of individuals and systems to respond respectfully and effectively to people of all cultures, classes, races, ethnic backgrounds, sexual orientations, and faiths or religions in a manner that recognizes, affirms, and values the worth of individuals, families, tribes, and communities and protects and preserves the dignity of each. First responders are in a unique position of interacting and serving the diverse communities of Maryland and must be equipped with the tools to empathetically interact with all cultures. HB 1276 commissions a study on best practices for the culturally sensitive inclusion of minority communities in the state and local emergency plans and management led by MEMA Additionally, requiring MEMA to conduct a survey of state and local emergency management plans to ascertain certain current emergency planning strategies and requiring MEMA to review certain emergency management plans. The need for emergency planning that keeps pace with the state's population is critical. All of Maryland's population growth since 2000 has been due to growth in minority population. From 2000 to 2012, the Hispanic population in Maryland has doubled an increase of about 4.4% of the total population. The Asian population has increased by 1.9% and the black population by 1.2%. Our state is diversifying and first responder training needs to reflect that. I thank you for your consideration and your patience for House Bill 1276 and I urge a favorable report. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Delegate, and no worries. We all understand, we've all been there. Um, I'd like to invite um, Husaifa Muhammad. Uh, yes, good afternoon. Um, thank you, Madam Chair and House Health and Government Operations Committee members. On behalf of the Maryland Office of the Council on American Islamic Relations, I want to thank you for this opportunity to, te to testify in support of House Bill 1276, entitled Maryland Emergency Management Agency. Emergency Planning and Management Cultural Competence. My name is Uzefa Mohammed, and I'm the Government Affairs Intern for the CARE Office in Maryland. CARE is America's largest Muslim civil rights and advocacy organization. The Maryland Emergency Management Agency, or MEMA, works to reduce the risk of disaster emergencies by working with residents and stakeholders in the state of Maryland. Its critical work helps to proactively manage consequences through collaborative work with communities and partners across our state. This bill will, will ensure that MEMA studies and makes recommendations on how to, how to deal with emergency responder situations to specific populations such as minorities, disabled individuals, and individuals with limited English speaking proficiency. This research will help meet the needs of residents with unique circumstances by requiring MEMA to come up with emergency planning strategies with spe which specifically cater to these individuals. By mapping out a strategy to better serve mar marginalized or ignored groups, we can ensure that all Maryland residents can benefit from emergency strategies that fulfill their own needs. We support this bill because it sets the tone for equitable access to vital public agency services. Therefore, we respectfully urge your vote in favor of House Bill 1276. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much. Uh, Reverend Kobe Little. Good afternoon, uh, hey, Madam is. Vice Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, and members of the committee. Uh, I'm Reverend Kobe Little, and I'm here on behalf of the Maryland State Conference of the NAACP 
We're thankful to uh, Delegate uh, Shanika Henson for sponsoring this legislation. And we ask a favorable report on this legislation with amendments. Uh, principally, uh, this uh, important legislation should not only address cultural competency, but it should also address uh, equity issues. Um, so in the title, we would like to see the title of this uh, change from simply cultural competency to equity and cultural competency. Also, emergency planning uh, should begin with the most vulnerable in mind, and that focus should not be lost throughout the process. So, um, you know, even with the COVID response, every uh, equity officer, every county equity officer, every jurisdictional, every uh, jurisdictional equity officer, every departmental equity officer should have been included in the emergency management team. And going forward, all emergency management uh, teams should include equity officers. And it, there is a distinction between uh, equity questions and, and, and questions of, of cultural competence. Cultural competence doesn't necessarily speak uh, to questions around um, economic insecurity. And, you know, if we, if we go here to uh, page one, line 24, the word minority appears as it relates to uh, different ethnic communities uh, that should uh, consideration should be given to. Maryland is moving into a, a, an era when there will be no min minorities or majorities in our state as it relates to population. And frankly, the terminology majority and minority derives from the language of structural inequity anyway. So we just like to see that word minority stricken. And then on page two, line five, we'd like to see um, equity best practices added. My time is up. I'm glad to answer any uh, specific questions about the amendments or the thinking behind the amendments. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend. Um, so I'd like to open it now to questions from the committee for the sponsor and these panels. Delegate Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Delegate, for bringing this bill. My question is, I see the dates on the bill and then I see the dates in the physical note. Is the funding lined up to match uh, your bill to be able to hire someone to oversee the study? Thank you, Delegate Johnson. That's an important question. I have an amendment that I've sponsored to the bill and the amendment is after consideration and conversation with Maryland Emergency Management. They have asked for the bill to be amended to have the due date for the report be a full year and to have it be due um, in July to substitute for the due date to be, I believe, July 2022. I have it there for December 31. They believe that if they have the opportunity for a full year to hire the contractor, that they'll get a better quality report and they'll produce a better result. In addition to that, AMEMA has asked to include um, studying the population that's children as well. They believe that they've gotten a sufficient interest from the public about how we'll handle the needs of children in, em in emergency planning too. So they've asked for that. So age appropriateness and children are, a, are part of the amendment that I would ask the co committee to consider as well. All right, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Delegate. Um, Delegate Hill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it's in, uh, I guess this is for the bill sponsor. I think uh, uh, Reverend Little raised uh, some questions that I was gonna actually ask about the narrow, the specificity on page one of talking about African-Americans, indigenous people, uh, and I don't have the bill right in front of me, but not mentioning Asian Pacific Islanders, Asian, uh, ethnic, uh, um, religious minorities that may be in communities. Um, so I'm gonna ask you if you are on board with the specific recommendations for the amendments that Dr. Little um, expressed, Reverend Little expressed, or there are other ways that you would like to change the wording to be clear, or do you want to keep it as it is and not start to become more specific? Can you? Thank you, Delegate Hill. That's um, and thank you, Reverend Little, for the testimony and raising some very um, thought-provoking and and dynamic points. Um, 
The bill does ask to study individuals that are facing socioeconomic challenges, um, individuals with limited English proficiency, and that could be a number of languages, um, individuals with religious restrictions. Um, and I don't know that restrictions is the best word, but the goal there was to try to understand if you have dietary limitations or dietary prescriptions as a result of religion, or if you have certain um, observances where you do different observances at different times of the day or times of the year, that that's being studied and that's being properly planned for when we're looking at um, disaster relief and emergency planning. Um, adding in different uh, races and ethnicities into the bill, I'm certainly open to that. And working with drafting, we were trying to strike a balance of what is defined in the code elsewhere and what exists in definitions in Maryland law. And I think not adding Asian Pacific Islander is simply just an oversight there. Um, and other minority communities, I think, was my attempt in working with drafting to make sure that if something was not included there, that we just um, multiracial, for example, I can I can see is not included there. If it's a need to study and we are talking to the different state agencies or different um, counties and they have needs to study particular groups that aren't mentioned there, making sure we haven't closed the door on anyone being included and served by this bill was my was the thinking on putting other minority communities there. But to Reverend Little's point, even the inclusion of the word minority um, could be a step in a direction that doesn't um, express the intent of the bill. And that is to give a full voice and a full study and a full look at how we are serving the needs of a population um, that perhaps isn't the the baseline when we go and we make policy here in the state and in our county levels. So I'm open to amendments that would make the bill serve its intent and its purpose even better. Madam Chair, may I just do a quick follow-up? Quick follow-up, Delegate. Okay, Delegate Henson, what I hear you saying, I just wanna make sure it's consistent because I, th I think it is that we're not even just talking about disadvantaged communities because when you talk about cultural uh, proficiency and equity with respect to MEMA, you can have middle class or wealthy communities that have cultural specifics that you would want the emergency personnel to be aware of. It does not necessarily require that there be dis, you know, financially disadvantaged, economically disadvantaged communities. Uh, would you agree with that? So we need to find some language that talks about the cultural proficiency and not necessarily tying it to whether groups are disadvantaged or not? That's correct. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Delegate Lewis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you to the bill sponsor. My internet connection is unstable, so I'll be quick. Um, I appreciate the bill, Delegate Henson. It's important. I wonder if you could share with us an example of what a culturally competent disaster response uh, system might look like? Are there good examples from other places that we could learn from? Was led to put the legislation in after reading some congressional analysis and reports that were generated post Katrina. And that's why my testimony started there, um, because that's where my journey towards the bill started. And I believe that in the analysis that was done by Congress, they did a great job at understanding where we missed the mark. Um, and the, uh, the planning that's done around the disability, the um, individuals with disabilities community that was done there, I think that they have done a great job at putting the mandates out and making sure that we plan to care for their needs correctly. And that's referenced in the fiscal note a little bit, the mandates that Congress put out there. And I think that as we, if we use that as a model, but we substitute a person's disability for a person's cultural needs, I think that we'll be on the right track. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, so that concludes the favorable panel. Thank you all. Um, I will go now to an unfavorable panel and ask for Vince McAvoy. Uh, yes, thank you so much, Chair, and um, thank you, uh, Delegate Hans. Good to see you again. Um, I am speaking un unfavorably in this bill, and um, if you, you know, I, I had to make sure I had my bearings correct because I when dealing with energy, uh, uh, used to deal a little bit with NEMA and FEMA. Um, there, 
list of emergencies of what they deal with in Maryland are this. Common to Maryland, floods, heat, drought, hurricanes, thunder, lightning, winter, storms. And, and I guess my point on this is that that affects all people the same. I guess I would take uh, Reverend Little's uh, statements a little bit further and say no majority, no minority. Americans, we all handle this the same way. If we do have societal differences in literacy and so forth, uh, we do have outreach. I know in Baltimore we have extensive outreach into the communities. Uh, it's going off the COVID right now uh, to uh, bring them on board. So I don't see that this is anything but a. Uh, I, I feel the bill is divisive in nature. We all we're all humans. We all deal with emergencies of flood, uh, thunder, lightning the same way. Um, where I do see room, uh, and actually, if you look at the staff, I, I find the staff is extremely diverse. You all should take a look at their site. Uh, but uh, where I do see room is, I notice other countries, particularly European countries, there are little icons that they have on signs, and, and the Japanese too, for the tsunamis. Um, you look at that pictorial, and it actually gives very good directions. And, and they showed that during the tsunamis, uh, that that actually helped direct people who weren't local to the area. Um, I would uh, highlight less Katrina, which look, we, we didn't want to support that because of levees and the cost down there. It's, it's underwater. And look at Houston. Look how Houston teamed together with recent hurricanes. I thank you for your time. Thank you. Are there questions for Mr. McAvoy? Seeing no questions from the committee, I thank the delegate for the bill and uh, those who can, the witnesses for your time and testimony today. And that concludes the hearing on HB 1276. And we will move to the next bill, which is HB 990, Delegate Krebs, uh, Maryland Department of Emergency Management, Establishment and Transfer of Maryland 911 Board. Delegate Krebs. Thank you, Madam Chair. Again, it's uh, Delegate here with House Bill 990, Maryland Department of Emergency Management, Establishment and Transfer of the Maryland 911 Board. As this committee is very familiar with, um, for the last um, several years, I've been on the next um, generation, the Commission to Advance Next Generation 911 across Maryland. And along with me has been our leader of this, which has been Senator Kagan, who's been a, a huge uh, proponent and educated us all in the needs to upgrade our systems. Um, and we're on the forefront of that in the United States. Um, also serving on that commission with me are Senator Riley and what was Delegate Jackson, my partner in crime on the House side and Delegate Jackson decided to move across the street to un, not as good a pastors as we have. And so he is now <laughs> off the commission because we needed another uh, delegate. We now have Delegate Hill is joining us. So thank you. I have a new partner in crime. So uh, we've really done a lot of great work and I've really been proud to be on this commission with the team of people that are on it. And I've learned so much over these years and our committee has passed a number of pieces of legislation to move this forward. But we've got some cleanup work to do that we put on the back burner and some of that is coming to us this year. So um, over the, this last year, uh, we still were working remotely and we wrestled with the question of what was the most efficient and effective emergency management structure in Maryland. Um, some of it was where does 911 belong, where, do they, where should they be housed? But we, after much discussion with, the, with 911 center directors and consultation with other states who've enacted similar legislation in their states, the commission unanimously recommended restructuring our emergency management system as reflected in this legislation. And since this discussion has gone on, we now see more than ever with, with COVID and the state of emergency we've been in, how important our emergency services, our emergency management structure has been. So what does this particular bill do? First, it upgrades the Maryland Department of Emergency Management, which is, um, it upgrades it to a cabinet level position of state government, replacing the Maryland Emergency Management Agency. So MEMA is what we call it now, and now we'd be calling it MDEM or MDM, emergency management, call it what you want. Uh, and it would report directly to the governor. Uh, and it also would transfer the Maryland 911 board from the Department of Public Safety and Corrections, which no one ever felt was a good fit, but it's sort of been there for a long time. And it would be now housed under this new uh, executive brand, executive level um, agency, Maryland Department of Emergency Management. 
As I mentioned, MEMA is currently located within the military department. Don't necessarily think it's a great fit. As it really just causes a little bit of confusion during emergencies. And as I mentioned, the 911 board has been awkwardly situated with the prison guards as part of the Department of Corrections. Um, just sort of left alone, been a little bit supported, but it wasn't always, um, the fit was not always there. So we believe that as a cabinet level department, this new uh, Maryland Department of uh, Emergency Management would be able to more effectively communicate with the governor during an emergency. And it makes sense to house the 911 board with, with other emergency management uh, experts for easy access to um, sa public safety resources. A number of states have already done this. And I think in our current state of emergency and with our opioid crisis, the opioid um, command center is under MEMA currently. I think there's a lot of synergies to this new realignment and partnership. Um, one of the other key re requirements for this move to be successful is our commitment that the 911 board would continue to be autonomous. And I say that because right now our 24 jurisdictions run their local 911s and we wanna continue that. It's been very successful because they know their communities the best. So we just wanna make sure the support is there um, for 911, but we also, they are, are, are continue to be autonomous. Um, MEMA has offered to help with the procurement and technical expertise on issues like 911 boards online presence. We don't have a great online presence right now. Also with recruitment, people ask all the time about how diversity and recruitment. Right now we have tough time, you know, recruiting for 911 specialists and we believe that MEMA could help with those, those services uh, and help address some of the disparities in recruiting, training and, and retraining 911 specialists. So MEMA has offered to help with these things. Um, I'm gonna let the folks on that are after me take the rest of my time, there's only a minute left, um, and ask them to uh, explain to you from their perspective why the time has come for us to better align our emergency management operations in Maryland. And I ask you guys to um, consider our report. If, if you need some bedtime reading, the report is available um, through my testimony. If you click on it and I will turn it over to my panel, um, Kevin Canale, Jack Markey, and then um, it says Stephanie Troxell, that is not accurate. That's my aide. It's Chief uh, Richard Brooks. All three <laughs> served on our 911 commission for the last three years. Um, Chief Brooks is retired, but still very active. And they've spent hours and hours and hours um, finding consensus on the best way to operate our 911. So I'll turn it over to them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate. So Kevin Canale, uh, you're first. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Kevin Canale here on behalf of the Maryland Association of Counties in strong support of House Bill 990. You have my written testimony. I would like to highlight a few points and I would like to thank Delegate Krebs and Delegate Hill as the newest member of this commission. This bill is the, is the result of hundreds of hours of work, uh, whether it be in subcommittees, committees, countless phone calls, and it's a great bill. And it's a great bill because it brought everybody to the table. And you've heard these bills before in this committee, you know about the stakeholder process. Everybody's on board here and we think it's a great product. Both MEMA and the 911 board provide invaluable assistance, guidance, and leadership to their local partners. And counties feel like by aligning these efforts, the bill would bolster and enhance collaboration, communication, and coordination between the state and county governments in time of crisis. It will also help to move Maryland toward next gen 911, deliver those services equitably across the state, and assure effective communication with communication providers. So we know with COVID, a lot of our emergency managers felt like if MEMA was a forward-facing entity in a cabinet level position, that coordination may have been a little bit more seamless. And so that's really, I think, a great point of why MEMA should be forward-facing. Just look at the, the pandemic. So we know that if they are in that forward-facing position, they'll be able to better work with county emergency management folks to develop scalable, flexible, and adaptable concepts and to better align key responsibilities and roles when disasters strike. The partnership will enable us to uh, ensure continu continuity of government in the face of an innumerable number of catastrophic events. So with that, I mean, I, I know we have more panelists here that can talk a little bit more about, you know, the folks that are the boots on the ground, but we believe that this bill would strengthen and streamline collaboration and planning response and recovery. And we'd ask for a favorable report on House Bill 990. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jack Markey. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee. Um, I'm here to speak for a few moments as a local emergency manager who also has the experience of working closely with the Next Generation 911 Commission and for the past 12 years 
Uh, also represent emergency management on the Maryland 911 board. Um, 911 and emergency management are functions that exist to bring out the best across the government in an interagency manner. Um, not always the direct player that takes the action, but always uh, the voice at the table to try to bring out the best across the government, uh, both within a certain level of government at the county level and also vertically with our municipal partners, our uh, peer counties, and then the state and federal government. Uh, 911 and emergency management work best when they are well aligned. And in the majority of Maryland jurisdictions, uh, 911 is a seamless partner with emergency management. Um, in certain jurisdictions, they may not exist in the same entity, the same organization, but they still serve that same critical function of assuring that when government needs to mobilize in response to our residents, that we know who to call, where to call, when to call, and can make the most effective use of minutes and seconds in the case of 911 uh, to save lives. And in the case of emergency management, that we're focused on the long-term interests of the community and how do we build collaborative consensus approaches to whatever challenges may face us, whether it's COVID, climate, uh, cybersecurity, that we're all aligned and supporting our senior elected officials, the governor at the state level, or our local senior elected officials. I urge your support for House Bill 990. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Richard Brooks. Well, good afternoon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with all of you. Before I begin, I want to acknowledge the uh, outstanding service of Delegate Krebs. Uh, mm -hmm. She was great to highlight all the others. Uh, but for the last three years, we've been seatmates on the commission. Uh, and it's been absolutely delightful from the beginning to answer her questions, then get on to, to spar over finite issues uh, and actually develop a friendship over the years between Carroll County uh, and Cecil County at the time. So well done, Delegate Krebs. Uh, I, as noted, I have retired uh, from Cecil County and uh, after 13 years as the Director of Emergency Services, and I'm now supporting our volunteer fire companies in Hartford County as much as six hours yesterday on multiple fires. And that's just what we all do. But I want to take you back to a time, uh, and perhaps some of you with a little snow on the roof uh, or a um, <laughs> you know, solar panel, as I talk about, you know, may remember the days when we had civil defense. And that was the teacher would tell us in our grade schools, get under the desk, we're having an air raid drill. Uh, on Monday afternoons at one o'clock, the siren would blow. Uh, that was a 90 minute respite from education. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, we had soldiers who, who managed civil defense. Well, that's matured. Uh, and we now have the professional organization of the Maryland Emergency Management. Uh, and they are a cutting edge business in Maryland and in government. And they're the conduit from uh, the Federal Emergency Management Agency through the states and the federal funding that comes in. And they see us through all the disasters that we've had. They're right with us. The other thing that this legislation does is it brings the, the 911 uh, board into alignment with emergency services. It gets them out of public safety and corrections and moves them into the emergency services where they're with people who communicate every day, like in the MJOC. Uh, so it's a good move. It puts us in progress. Uh, it, it keeps us in unison and lockstep as we protect the citizens. And I or urge your support for 990. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Um, questions from the committee for the panel, the sponsor in the panel, Delegate Johnson. Thank you. And thank you, Delegate, for bringing the bill. And thank you, panel, for testifying. Uh, I agree 100% with the 911 part of the bill. My question is, right now, MEMA is housed under the military department. And I'm assuming d during an emergency, the military department coordinates and communicates with the governor's office. So where's the breakdown and the need to move uh, MEMA out of out from under the military department, if you could help me understand that piece. Delegate Krebs, is that you? Yes, oh. uh, we had lengthy discussion about it. I could talk to you offline about it more, more in detail. It just, they do more, they do, they have different activities. And if you look at what that, what MEMA is responsible for, um, they're responsible for any major 
a disaster. It could be a flood. It could be COVID. It could be opioid crisis. It's not always in, including the military. And it just, with, with the, the new things that are falling under MEMA, it manages many of the federal grants that fund a broad range of initiatives um, from man-made disasters and things like that, not necessarily the same thing that the National Guard would do. And we just felt that there are so many things now that they they are responsible for that they needed that seat at the table and not necessarily a, a, have to go through the military department. Uh, I, there is a letter in the file about from the military department, not necessarily saying support, but they, they basically give the reasons that I've been giving of, of why it might be a good move. It's basically okay. a policy decision up to us, but not, not um, opposing <laughs> the move. There's some economies of scale in, in this move, the way we're trying to do it. Okay, thanks, that cleared some things up. I'd be happy to talk to you about it. Any other questions from the committee? Okay, seeing no further questions, we thank the delegate for bringing us the bill and the witnesses for their time and testimony today. That concludes the hearing on HB 990. We will move to the next bill, which is HB 989, right before our delegate Krebs. Um, this is public safety 911 emergency telephone system alterations. Delegate Krebs. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Susan Krebs, Delegate Krebs here with the House Bill 989, uh, continuing along with public safety, 911 emergency uh, telephone system. Oh, we call this the omnibus bill because this bill basically has a lot of little things in it that the committee has talked about. Um, just, I call it cleanup bill. And so for the past three years, as I mentioned before, we've had this commission to advance next, gen next generation 911 across America. And we released three annual reports. And if, again, if you want to read the annual reports, if you want to have some bedtime reading in 2019 and 20, um, the one from 2020, we basically incorporated into nine little um, laws that are in this bill with bipartisan support and efforts. So I'll, I'm just going to tell you briefly what they are. And I'm going to let the panel explain to me to, with why. Um, number one, we're going to modify the, the, the 911 board membership, and there's a chart in, the, in your file that shows you uh, what we want to add. Uh, we, we want to add like cybersecurity. We talked about that in the previous bill, somebody with finance experience, accessibility issues. So we believe that the board needs to be upgraded uh, to, to um, reflect current times. So you can look at that, uh, that, that chart to see that. Uh, we need. We believe that we need more expertise on the board as we implement the um, technology and face the new challenges. We also want to require um, psychological training for 911 specialists. Um, the bills that we passed in previous years, we're now going to have texting to 911. We're going to have video to 911, and don't think about your 911 specialists and the tolls that it takes on them, especially now that they're responding to these other live events. So we call them our, the first of our first responders, our 911 specialists. And they, they basically experience um, people with suicidal thoughts um, and calling them. And then some of our folks actually have suicidal thoughts because of some of the, um, some of the stress that they're under. So um, it will require psychological training for these specialists. We also want to have a study of workers' compensation for 911 specialists. There was some push to, to, to put some legislation in and we said, let's study it first and, and, uh, and find out what the needs are. The next big thing is providing funding for recruitment. Um, recruitment is costly for our local governments, our local public safety answering points, which is our PSAPs. And they have inefficient funds. And so being under the military department, if we pass um, the previous bill and then providing funding for recruitment to our agencies will help us make sure that these people are, are adequately trained and that we have a qualified people as 911 specialists. And um, it would also help us recruit a, a more diverse um, population. The other thing is a mandated 911 outage notification. I won't get into the weeds on this because it's very technical, but we need to make sure that if there's outages on your cell phones or on your or landlines, that there's notification to um, in an emergency to, um, to the appropriate people. And we have put some language in there. And there is also an amendment um, that I will, we've been working on with the providers. Um, there's a whole, a whole slew of back and forth about the amendment, but um, there's an amendment in the packet that we've all agreed to about um, how many, what the standards should be for the 911 outage notifications. And then um, ensure that 911 contracts use standardization geographic data. As we know, um, we try, when you call on your phone, you want to know where you are when you call 911 because you, you're not at a home address anymore. So we want to make sure that all of our counties and even our, our coordinating states like Virginia 
um, that, that we use um, quality geographic data to make sure that we can locate that person. Um, there's a, an example on here. Um, there was a drowning of a, a person on the border of Loudoun County, Virginia and Montgomery County because they couldn't locate exactly where that person was and they didn't know who should respond and making sure that we use standardized geographic data will ensure that we can locate that person exactly where they are. And then the last thing that's in here is enforcing Carrie's law. And if you all remember Carrie's law, um, it's basically, it was a tragic event when um, someone was murdered by her husband in, in Texas and the daughter tried to call 911 from the hotel room. 911, we teach our kids, but we don't tell them, hey, like in our office, you gotta call nine, you gotta call a uh, dial out with a nine before the nine. So we wanna make sure that every place you don't have to dial anything before a preamble before 911, whether it's in an office building, whether it's in the state house, whether it's in a hotel room, and it tells who would be responsible um, uh, for, for making sure that that occurs and we educate mm -hmm. for that. So these are, this, like I said, the omnibus bill um, of the little things that sort of add up to make sure that our 911 system works properly. And I'll turn it over to my panel to um, talk about some of these issues. Okay, thank you, Delegate. Uh, Kevin Canale. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Kevin Canale here in support of House Bill 989 on behalf of the Maryland Association of Counties. Again, you have my written testimony. I would like to make just a few points. This is a very important bill and the components of this bill are all equally important. Number one, as we continue our move toward next gen 911, it's very important that we make sure the 911 board is populated with the folks that represent the proper interests that need to weigh in, that need to have input on our decisions as we move forward toward next gen. So we appreciate that the bill adds the necessary expertise by adding a, a county finance person, 911 specialist, an expert from the cybersecurity industry, and a member to represent persons with disabilities, which is very, very important as we make this move. Number two, we appreciate that the bill requires that telecommunications providers promptly notify 911 call centers in the case of an outage. Of course, we need that information as soon as possible to be able to communicate with our residents and let them know if there's an alternative communication that they should be using. And at number three, we really appreciate that the bill uh, addresses the persistent shortage of 911 specialists by requiring the board to establish an, a sort of an information hub, right, that will offer guidance, best practices, and strategies to boost recruitment for our 911 uh, folks in, in, in the 911 centers. So Madam Chair and members, this bill is going to bolster the framework and the resources to continue on our path toward the successful transition to a statewide next-gen 911 system where all boats will rise together. Mm -hmm. And we believe this bill enhances public safety communications in Maryland and in our local communities. And we'd urge a favorable report on House Bill 989. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jack Markey. Madam Chair, members of the committee, again, uh, Jack Markey, Frederick County, Maryland Division of Emergency Management. Uh, I urge your support for House Bill 989, and I will again uh, thank Delegate Krebs, as Chief Brooks did, for participation in the committee. I will speak just briefly about the process that the Commission has gone through to arrive at these recommendations. I think Delegate Krebs and Mr. Canale have done an outstanding job of pointing out the individual elements. I think it's critically important for those who don't have the opportunity to participate directly on the commission or the opportunity to uh, engage in our virtual meetings over the internet to understand that a diverse group of individuals uh, representing uh, uh, many different perspectives on problems related to the transition to next generation 911 have for the last several years worked very hard to bring these uh, top issues that we are able to achieve consensus on forward into legislation. Uh, the wisdom of the General Assembly to appoint the commission and to give us a, a set of tasks to carry out has led to proposals like what you see in the omnibus bill, which is HB 989 this year. Um, we work very hard to provide quality, uh, forward-looking, recommendations for legislation that will take Maryland forward and ensure that next generation 911 can meet the needs of Marylanders. So I urge your support for HB 989 and uh, we'll give the rest of my time to Chief Brooks. Well, actually it's Anna Sierra. <laughs> That's who I have. 
My apologies. Yeah. <laughs> so she'll get the seventeen. Chairman Pendergrass. <laughs> yep. Thank you. Vice Chair Pena Melnick and committee members, thank you very much for having me today here to testify in favor of House Bill 989. My name is Anna Sierra. I'm the Director of Emergency Services for Caroline County. I'm the Public Safety Answering Point Director, otherwise known as the 911 Center Director, as well as the appointed Local Emergency Manager. I'm a Maryland 911 Board Member responsible for representing counties with populations under 200,000, and I'm a Next Generation 911 Commission Member where I represent the Eastern Shore County. I'm also the highest jurisdictional official for the Caroline County Emergency Medical Services Operational Program. I share those credentials with you because it's important to understand that this 911 bill is a vital part of an interconnected system of emergency services that works together to ensure the safety and security of Maryland residents. Bill 989's multifaceted approach at improving 911 service and support for 911 specialists is imperative to the larger emergency services system in the state. This bill will increase 911 board membership to include several vital positions. Specifically, it will ensure that public safety answering points are represented on a geographic basis. Until now, the law has not required 911 center representation. Given the board's responsibility for not only funding 911 projects, but also sending 911 standards and policy, it only makes sense that 911 center directors would have representation on the board. In addition, the board will expand to include representatives of the disability and accessibility needs community as appointed by the Secretary of Disabilities. This seems particularly timely and appropriate now as we are all having robust conversations within our communities about the unequal burden that our vulnerable residents have borne in the course of the pandemic. It's important to give a voice to the creation of policy and standards regarding 911 to the disability community so that they can ensure that those unable to use 911 in a traditional method are considered in our discussions. Crucially, this bill also lays out requirements for 911 carriers to report outages to local public safety answering point directors. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today in support of House Bill 989. Thank you. Um, questions for this panel, uh, Chairman Pendergrass. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And this is probably for Delegate Krebs, unless she has a designee who she feels could answer it, sit, be, answer it better. And if none of the above, it can be answered in subcommittee. I'm looking at the two bills together. And the second, the bill we just heard that we're on now has a relatively small fiscal note and it comes out of the special fund, the 911 fund, I presume. The prior bill has a huge fiscal note and uh, it seems to come out of the general fund. Nothing about special funds in that. Um, it's possible that that money is being spent in the department, but it doesn't, and then moving to a different department, but it doesn't clarify that that's the case. It looks like it's got sort of a quarter of a million dollar fiscal note for the next number of years. So um, I'm concerned about the fiscal note, and I guess I need some explanation from you at this time or in the future. Well, on the fiscal note on the first bill, as, as you said, on, the, on this bill, it all would come out of the fund. It would come out of the nine, the fees that are coming from the fund. Department of Legislative Services determined that, that the new um, Department of Emergency Management would require three additional positions to carry out the administrative functions that would work for both right now. Um, and that, that would be for accounting, procurement, and I think HR. I think that was what it was. That, that's what they determine. I mean, the question becomes, should some of that come out of 911? I don't know, but that's what they determine would be needed um, for them to continue to do the duties and not have the military department doing with them. But um, I mean, on one hand, it says that the uh, uh, there's no the transfer of existing MEMA um, has no net effect on state finances, but then they go to say we, they need these three positions. So I question that as well. I think we can do Exactly the problem mm -hmm. I was having, Delegate Krebs. I would I think clarification to that when it's can you know when you get I don't it. Di I don't disagree with you I question it as well thank you thank you thank you are there any other questions for this panel from the committee okay we will move to a favorable with amendment and that's Sean Looney good afternoon madam chair uh, rare treat to be here in HGO and uh, also a rare treat to be testifying in favor of a bill but uh, <laughs> this has been a great effort I've been part of this commission for three years and I've just been in awe of the amazing work that they have done um, on this issue. And Maryland, frankly, has become a leader in the nation on E911, thanks to the effort of this commission, the leadership of Delegate Krebs and, and the other senators who've been involved. So 
Obviously, my concern is about the providers and the notification requirements, but we've been able to work out, I think, a reasonable balance as far as requiring timely notification in the case of an outage without messing up existing practices and federal regulations and things like that. So um, I urge the committee to give this bill a favorable report and let Maryland continue to be a leader in E911 around the country. Thank you. Okay. Uh, questions for Mr. Looney, Chairman Pendergrass? No? Okay. Um, I have a question. Uh, to see you, Sean. Um, uh, so are you saying that the, the amendment has been, uh, will be incorporated into the bill? You've already had that discussion and- Yeah, that's correct. Yes. We're, we're in agreement. Um, not to get too, the Comcast amendment is, has already been in the bill. There was another issue raised by some wireless providers that's now being worked on, but there is now complete consensus on the amendments. So the bill as it will be amended is, is met with the uh, okay with all the providers. Wonderful. Thank and you. We should have a copy. You should have a copy of the amendment 473326. That's one. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am chair. Seeing no further questions from the committee, that um, concludes the hearing on 989. We thank the delegate and the witnesses for their time and um, testimony today. We will move to HB 835. This is Delegate Shoemaker. This is uh, States of Emergency and Catastrophic Health Emergencies, Renewals, Authorization by General Assembly or Legislative Policy Committee. Delegate Shoemaker. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. It's good to be with you all. Uh, I haven't had a bill hearing in uh, this committee, I believe, uh, since the uh, furniture bill back in 2016. So it's been a while and it certainly is a pleasure to be before you here today. Let me, uh, let me say at the outset that, you know, I think this is a relatively simple bill, but in my estimation, it's an important one. Uh, I would also say as a uh, threshold matter uh, that this bill is not targeted uh, at the current occupant of the second floor. It's merely an effort to address what I believe is a deficiency in the law, which has merely been brought to light by the pandemic over the last year. So why do we need this bill? Shortly after 9-11, uh, the legislature gave the governor the power here in Maryland to unilaterally uh, declare states of emergency and to unilaterally extend states of emergency every 30 days. Now, keep in mind that the legislature then in 2002 uh, was acting against the backdrop of the tragic events of September 11th and, and ceding that authority. I highly doubt it was contemplating a situation where states of emergency uh, could continue to be extended every 30 days for a year like we have now, uh, merely through executive fiat. So what my bill would do is simply this. It would empower the governor a state of emergency for 30 days. It would enable him or her to extend the state of emergency unilaterally for an additional 30 days. And any further extensions would require legislative input. If we're in session, it would require action by the Maryland General Assembly. If we aren't in session, it would require majority support from the Legislative Policy Committee. And that recognizes the fact that, you know, we're only in session for 90 days. And let me say that in view of these unprecedented times, courts and legislatures across the country in red and blue states uh, have begun to examine their existing laws uh, regarding executive powers, uh, PA, New York, Michigan, Ohio, they spring to mind. In Michigan, uh, Governor Whitmer's state of emergency was overturned by the Michigan Supreme Court because the law she relied upon 
was found to violate Michigan's constitutional uh, separation of powers clause. Uh, Maryland's constitution also has a separation of powers clause in Article 8 of the Declaration of Rights. And all, those, all this bill does is to try to promote the interest of good government and the concept of separation of powers. And the governor is supposed to execute the laws. The legislature is supposed to make the laws. This bill merely restores the legislature's role, plain and simple. It doesn't say that the governor can't extend a state of emergency beyond the period provided for in the bill. It just provides for the General Assembly's input. And the notion, quite frankly, of the, you know, behind this bill seems to have uh, support from both sides of the aisle down here and seems to have generated some uh, public interest as well. And with that, uh, I would ask for a favorable report on HB 835. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Delegate. Uh, I'd like to call on Vince McAvoy. Thank you so much, Committee. Uh, can you hear me all right? A little bit louder would be good. Okay, I'll try. Thank you so okay. much. I appreciate it, Delegate. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Committee, for um, hearing this bill and for hearing me. Thank you so much, Delegate Shoemaker, for bringing this bill. This is extremely important. I want you all to envision this, that when this bill passes, and I'm presuming it'll be voted favorable out of committee, we will be under state of emergency for a year and a half. That's never, I could not imagine that the legislature, legislative people I've seen for a decade ever envision that or that the people ever wanted that. You couple that with the fact that we had a 5,000% increase in unemployment. 30 to 40% of, of small businesses shuttered. This is all due to overreach. Delegate Shoemaker's bill is simple. It's to the point. It allows for the checks and balances. When I first started coming to Annapolis, check and balance issue was really for, for the courts and the legislature. I never envisioned this as being part of the executive. We have an executive in office right now who is being investigated that there are three lawmakers, uh, I think one Senate, two in the House, who are pushing for examination of goings on regarding the shutdown. So though Delegate Shoemaker's thinking a little bit far ended than I am. I'm looking at the here and now. I'm looking at the destruction of a state going on right now. And there's only one body because the courts have been shut down. They're suppressing court cases. There's only one body in Maryland who can take the reins of this. I urge you all to vote favorable on this, to put some sense and to, to pay attention to your constituents when they're telling you that they're in, in hardship, the children are in depression, mm -hmm. and everyone's losing jobs left and right. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for hearing us. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, are there questions for the delegate and his panel? Uh, delegate Chisholm. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I apologize if I miss this, uh, Delegate Shoemaker, but I was looking through. I. I do remember looking at the two ways to stop the state of emergency during the uh, when the pandemic started, and it was one by the the governor um, proclaiming that the state of emergency had ended, and then by joint resolution. And I looked through the Constitution. I think it was by majority vote. Does this bill speak to if we got together after 30 days, what that vote would have to be to overturn a state of emergency? No. Um, thank you for the question, Delegate Chisholm. All, all, all it says is that it, it, I, I don't think it addresses that particular mechanism at all. All this says is that to extend a state of emergency, I guess conceivably beyond the initial 60 days that's contemplated under this bill, if we were in session, it would require uh, affirmative vote of both chambers of the General Assembly to continue uh, it for another 30-day period or whatever the case may be. 
Uh, and if we weren't in, in session, the issue would have to go to the, the uh, Legislative Policy Committee and there would have to be a majority vote from them. So that's, that, that's all it says about that. It does not uh, uh, tamper uh, with the provisions of the law regarding the uh, resolution process that you alluded to. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Delegate Morgan. Delegate Morgan, perhaps you're on mute. My bad. There we go. <laughs> you know, it's my first Zoom meeting. I had to learn. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, Delegate Shoemaker, thanks for bringing this bill forward. Just a really couple quick questions. In your research, uh, you know, we've had a state of emergency for the last year, but have you ever had a, a state of emergency in Maryland longer than 30 days? Not that I've found, Delegate Morgan. And like I said in my in my uh, opening remarks, I really doubt that the legislature back in 2002, when it was acting against the backdrop of 9-11, like I said, would have contemplated such an extended state of emergency like the one we're dealing with today. So right currently under current law, just a quick follow up question, currently under current law, uh, how long can the state of emergency continue for? He, well, under current law, he yes. could extend it. He could extend it uh, unilaterally every 30 days uh, indefinitely. Okay, good information. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Oh, you're welcome. Um, any other questions from the committee? Okay, seeing no further questions. Yes, oh, wait, Madam Chair. Oh, there we go. Question, question okay. occurred late. Um, <laughs> This is for the sponsor. Yes, ma'am. I heard you say that he could extend this, a governor could extend this every three, every month for a year. No. Why did I hear that? Well, no, I mean, I, I think somebody was saying, somebody was alluding to the fact that we've been under a state of emergency uh, for the last year. But you know, my reading of the law is that as it's uh, configured today is that he has to extend it, he or she, as the case may be, has to extend it every 30 days. But, and, and that's what I believe this governor has done. He's extended the state of emergency every 30 days uh, over the last year. Do you believe that the bill, I mean, the law as it stands now is unlimited, that he could, that he or she could extend this for 10 years, if that's how long the crisis lasted and if the legislature didn't come into session to deal with it. I, I, I do believe that, Madam Chair, yes. Okay, thank you for clarifying my misunderstanding of that. What that's quite all right, any time. Um, Delegate Rosenberg. And following up on the chair's question, do we lack, what authority, if any, do we have now under existing law to say Governor, you can no longer extend, or you must come to us and justify, or what? What? What powers do we currently have? Delegate Rosenberg, I think, as as Delegate Chisholm alluded to, I think there is a mechanism in the law, as we sit here today, that. Uh, and this joint, joint resolution is a constitutional majority in each house. I believe that's the case, but I'm not. I, that was a question mark. I, I, I on need my to part. check on know. that. I, I'm, I'm not sure about that, but I, I believe uh, there's a mechanism in law for a joint resolution to end a state of emergency if we were so inclined. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. You're welcome. Any other questions from the committee? Um, seeing none, we thank the sponsor for bringing us the bill and the panel for of witnesses. Um, and uh, that concludes the hearing on HB 835. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we'll move to HB 920, Delegate Carr, Open Meetings Act, Definition, Administrative Function. Delegate Carr. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, colleagues. For the record, Al Carr, here to present House Bill 920. Government works 
better when people have confidence in their government. As Bill 920 improves public confidence in government by strengthening the Maryland Open Meetings Act. There are certain actions that can be taken by a public body that fall into a gray area in the Open Meetings Act. These are personnel actions, uh, interviewing a candidate, hiring, firing, doing a performance review. Uh, these are actions that might not be subject to the act uh, because they could fall under the administrative function or they could be subject to the act uh, under the personnel uh, exemption. Uh, and if you read the Open Meetings Act manual that is written by the Attorney General, it talks about how this is problematic for uh, public bodies, it's problematic for the public, and it's problematic for the Open Meetings Compliance Board because there are situations where it's not clear. Uh, and their advice, of course, the best practice is when in doubt, assume that the act applies and have your open meeting or close your open meeting to, uh, for the appropriate uh, reason. So I've run across this issue in um, dealing with uh, different public bodies, especially our housing authority in Montgomery County where we had examples of, um, you know, were they meeting in, uh, did they meet? They wouldn't say whether they met or whether they didn't meet, but to the extent that they did meet, it was under the administrative function, which is very uh, confusing. And we don't want people to have the impression that public bodies are operating in secret. So uh, the bill uh, is, uh, it's simple, it's common sense, and it clarifies that when a public body is meeting for that reason, um, it's not part of the administrative function. They, they can do it uh, under um, the personnel exemption. Uh, so there is a letter from the Open Meetings Compliance Board in opposition to this bill. And they reviewed the bill as uh, introduced. And so after observing their deliberations on this bill, uh, we uh, introduce an amendment that's in your packet. Uh, the amendment narrows the scope of the bill to uh, those employees that the uh, public body has direct jurisdiction over. So I think it addresses um, some points in that, in that letter that this bill might le lead to, to uh, a heavy workload for the Open Meetings Compliance Board and a, and a big increase in uh, complaints. I think the amendment addresses that concern. Um, I ask for your favorable report and uh, to, uh, I don't know if my, my witness is here, Craig O'Donnell, who's a retired uh, journalist who's become uh, an expert on open government, but uh, I'll, I don't think he needs it, but I'll cede the rest of my time to him. Okay, then I will call on Craig O'Donnell. Thank you, Delegate. Uh, yes, hello. Um, can you hear me? I can. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm a retired reporter and have been an open meetings advocate since 2004. Uh, and I certainly support this bill as amended. Uh, whether or not personnel matter, matters should be subject to the act has been uh, up for discussion since 2005 when the open meetings compliance board uh, completed a report to the General Assembly. And it comes up uh, once a year, twice a year in their opinions. The amended bill would bring the same disclosure as uh, uh, our, uh, I'm sorry, I'm new at this. While the compliance board can encourage a public body to conduct its personnel discussions as if they are covered by the act, it's only advice and the existing law allows high-level personnel discussions without public knowledge. Uh, in their latest annual report, the Compliance Board said, and I quote, although members of the public may seek records through the Public Information Act and then submit a complaint, 
they would not necessarily know to ask for records of a discussion held entirely in the dark. And that's exactly the problem. Nothing has to be disclosed about a gathering under the administrative exclusion. May I continue? Yes, yes, you. You, you got the delegate's time. Okay, uh, so there are two cases. Uh, let's say there's an evaluation of an executive's director, uh, an annual evaluation of an executive's director's performance held during a regular closed session uh, during a regularly scheduled meeting. In that case, the act requires a closing statement and also a summary in the minutes. And even if this discussion is considered administrative, there are disclosures that would be required. But the same discussion could be taken up in a purely administrative gathering, whether it's in person, over Zoom, on the telephone, and no documentation or disclosure is ever required. So the question becomes, is this proposal too broad? With the amendment, the bill focuses on employees who are under a public body's direct jurisdiction, not every employee of an agency or uh, let us say a county government. The bill did, uh, would not affect public bodies that make their personnel decisions in closed session during a regular meeting. Uh, I, I believe that most public bodies proceed this way. In other cases, it might require some uh, scheduling of personnel discussions during a regular meeting. But let me give you an example before I conclude. The State Board of Education uses the Acts exception and doesn't find it burdensome. Uh, on June 25th, 2019, their meeting minutes report, at 1 p.m. all staff left the meeting, state board members discussed the superintendent's evaluation, the session ended at 2.15 p.m. So the bill doesn't try to address all of the administrative exceptions complications. It simply brings the same disclosures through consistent documentation to personnel matters. And I thank you for a favorable report. Thank you, Mr. O'Donnell. Uh, are there questions of the committee? Delegate Rosenberg. Question for the sponsor. Uh, have you shared your amendment with the opponent of the bill? And if you did, what was their response? Uh, um, yes, thank you, Delegate, for that great question. Yes, as soon as I obtained the amendment, I did share it with uh, the opponent, I did not hear any response uh, from the board. I mean, the board does a fantastic job. I don't think they meet terribly often. Um, so, um, you know, if we were to pass this bill, if the House were to pass the bill, they would certainly have another opportunity uh, it, to go over to it, it, the Senate attention. where they could take us up again and, and they could uh, mm -hmm. uh, on it. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions from committee members? Okay, seeing none, that completes the hearing on HB 920. Thank you, Delegate. Thank you, Mr. O'Donnell, for your time and testimony today. And we'll move to Bill 1013, Delegate Crosby. Provisions, standard time, year-round daylight savings time. Delegate Crosby. Thank you, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, and distinguished members of the committee. For the record, Delegate Brian Crosby here to present House Bill 1013 entitled General Provisions Standard Time Year-Round Daylight Savings Time. So all the bill would do is formalize Maryland's intent to remain on daylight savings time, uh, spring forward time. And the easiest way I can explain this is that once we jump forward on Sunday, we would stay there and never change our clocks again. Um, <laughs> and honestly, I brought this forward just out of my own personal hatred to moving the clocks. Um, and I, you know, there was no advocacy group behind this at all. It's just, I cannot stand when we move the clock one way or the other. Uh, a little unique twist to my bill is that it also is contingent upon all of the other states, including the District of Columbia on the East Coast uh, to enact the same provision. And like any other, any of the other 15 states who have already enacted this legislation, it also requires the federal government to amend the uniform time code, uh, which only permits states to remain in their respective time zones standard time. 
Uh, one thing I wanted to debunk, many people believe that this was brought forward because of farmers. I have talked to at least 100 farmers and not one of them seems to ever understand how they got roped up into this argument. Uh, but it was actually brought forward in World War I to conserve energy. It went away for a brief amount of time and then FDR brought it back up in World War II and it was known as wartime to conserve energy. But every study shows that if it saves energy, it's negligible at best. Uh, and there's no evidence that says that, hey, if we do this, then we're gonna con uh, conserve a ton of energy um, in the future or when we make that shift. So time, ch time changes are not universal. As many of you are aware, Arizona and Hawaii uh, do not observe time changes. As I mentioned earlier, 15 states have passed similar legislation. California and Florida were most recently uh, to adopt the language of daylight savings time year round. Another 30 states are considering this change, which is almost double from two years ago, uh, which I think is kind of cool that, that we're seeing a movement. And I think there are some real health reasons why we would want to change. In the days subsequent to changing the clock, either way, keep in mind, strokes are up, heart attacks are up, car, car accidents are up, work accidents are up. Frankly, overall death. Uh, is up after we make the subsequent clock change. Um, and there are numerous studies to support this. Additionally, when I filed this bill, I think last year was the first time I filed it. Uh, I, you know, one thing, I, I'm a single guy or engaged. I don't have any kids, but parents hit me up because, you know, they, they struggle when the clocks move back, their kids are getting up at 4 a.m. Or when we jump forward, they're struggling to get their kids out of bed for class especially these days when, you know, the parent may have to go off to work and in Zoom, there's an increased chance that kids are going to miss class because their parents may be working and they've overslept. One of the things to keep in mind here, and I don't, I don't have any panelists, but I'm sure that there are going to be plenty of people who are favorable with amendments and they're going to argue standard time. I'll be the first one to tell you personally, I don't really care. I just want the madness to end. But um, I can tell you that if you go to standard time, would be opposed. Um, there's actually a large contingency of outdoor cookers and barbecuers that are opposed and golfers are opposed. So that's just something to keep in mind. And additionally, there are some states in the eastern uh, time zone that are really far east. Um, and so if we were to go to standard time, they would essentially have darkness at parts of the year at like 4 p.m. And I don't think that that's right. Additionally, some, some reasons to go to daylight savings time is there's better mental health overall with more evening light hours. So despair actually drops. More evening light hours typically means uh, a healthier population as more people work out and would run after work. There's improvement in driving safety. Smog decreases in afternoon rush hour because of sunlight. There's lower crime and retail sales actually improve. So the one thing I would ask is this Sunday, when March 14th, when clocks jump forward, I'm not even going to ask you for a favorable report here. I just want you to shoot me a text message or an email about how, how unfavorable you feel in one of those three days. And then, you know, ask yourself, why do we continue to do this? Uh, I think that's a real, a, a legitimate public policy question. And for those reasons that hopefully you will see in early parts of next week, uh, the committee votes a favorable report on House Bill 1013, and I'm happy to take questions at this time. Thank you, Delegate. Uh, Delegate Rosenberg gets the first question. Bad behavior on my part. I didn't take down my hand. Uh, Sorry. Okay, then, then it's Delegate Saab. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Just a quick question to the Delegate. Would I lose an, an hour in the morning, or would I gain an hour in the morning with this <laughs> So you, I mean, I guess you would lose the hour in the morning when we jump forward, but then it would, you would never have to change your clock again. So there will be more daylight later, not earlier. Right. So, well, so with that, in all seriousness, so our, um, my board of education or the Anne Arundel Public School have submitted an opposition letter that, and trust me, I, I'd like to, well, I like to gain an hour in the morning. Uh, many of my friends know that I appreciate the extra hour of sleep. But if you can just, uh, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at the Anne Arundel County Public School opposition letter that 
that the time, the school time is consistent with students' health, safety, and student development needs. As the question is, did you have a chance to look at that opposition letter? And if you have, what comments do you have? I, I didn't. Um, to be honest, there are some health benefits to standard time that I'm sure that they cite. Uh, and I'm impartial. I mean, I, I just don't want the clock to change. So if we think it's better, or the committee thinks it's better that we just stay on standard time uh, for educational purposes, I I'm fully okay with that. I think that in an informal poll that I've run and many of the polls that I've seen online, I think the general public is much more in favor of going to daylight savings time. That's why I put it forth as such. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Uh, Delegate Bagman. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you to the sponsor for bringing this bill. I'm actually going to dig down a little bit more into mm -hmm. the Anne Arundel County Public Schools mm -hmm. uh, response because I know they've been in a three-year study of school start times and, and healthier school start times. Um, and, and to their point, um, if, we, if, we, if we stay in daylight saving time, potentially um, the, 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 the morning hours, um, at the current school start times, they would be um, they would be going to school in, in darkness. But I know that this is a good conversation to have now because we're talking about school start times. So, do you know how other states that have done this have addressed that early morning educational aspect to make sure that school that the students weren't going to school in in darkness? I don't, but that's a great question, and I will. I'll happily do the research for that. Um, I can tell you in St. Mary's County, and I know uh, one of my colleagues from St. Mary's County sits on this committee, could probably mention, you know, Spring Ridge uh, Middle School starts at 6 a.m. So, I mean, they, they're starting in the dark already. Um, so that it's not like this, that would be uh, unfamiliar in some jurisdictions. But I will do the research to figure out how these other school jurisdictions have done this or other states uh, have done this and, and I'll happily get back to the committee. It's a great question and it's fair. Thank you so much. Delegate Kipke. Thank you, Madam Chairman. As someone who's been terrorized by this ridiculousness uh, and having three little kids, I mean, it just really screws things up at the Kipke house. I mean, I'm glad uh, they'll be sleeping a little later in the morning coming up here uh, after Sunday. But uh, my question is, um, of all the states that have passed something, have they all moved to daylight uh, um, savings time or did any of them move to standard time? I think all 15 moved to daylight savings time. I'll, I'll confirm that, but I'm pretty sure Hawaii and Arizona went to standard time and the other 15 that I looked at uh, were daylight savings time. Great, thank you. I, I truthfully think it's just out of popularity. Um, Delegate Hill. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Delegate Crosby, for bringing this bill because you're absolutely right. enough is enough. Um, but here it is. So according to the fiscal note, any state can exempt itself from observing daylight savings time. But if we want to observe it year round, we can't do that. So since you're agnostic, if it's the will of the committee that we want to stop changing twice a year. I wanna be clear that you're fine with, even though it may be different from the other 15 states and instead of being three hours ahead of California, it may change it to two hours or four hours, I haven't figured it out. But you're fine if we just do what we legally can do without federal, under federal law, which is just choose to exempt ourselves from observing daylight savings time at all. A thousand percent. The only question I think that it's worthwhile um, is that if you continue to see a movement or we continue to see a movement towards going to daylight savings, I don't think we want to be the only state on the East Coast that observes standard time while everybody else on daylight savings time. But, you know, It'll just we, set us, we'll just have a fixed amount of time that we're ahead or behind yeah. others, which is different from where we are now. But yeah, we can, we can address that when the bridge, you know, when we cross that bridge or we get to that bridge. So, thank but you. yeah, I, I am totally agnostic. Great. Thank you. Um, so, Delegate Crosby, I have a question. Uh, in your research, have you seen any evidence, is there any inclination of looking at this issue at a federal level? So, I, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm, not, I'm not aware of any federal uh, sponsors to this bill. 
Um, all I can tell you is that, I mean, this is kind of like a niche thing and I, I don't know if I'm in some sort of underground community where like <laughs> there's like 4 million of us texting, but it is certainly popular. Um, and I think that there are a lot of advocates that are trying to bring it to the federal level, but I'm not aware of any federal sponsor. At this point. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, seeing no other questions for the sponsor, I'll do an unfavorable panel and we'll start with uh, Lisa uh, Van Booskirk. Uh, you're on mute. <laughs> Still on mute. <laughs> There we sorry, go. Sorry, I thought I hit it. Um, oh, and now I have lost. Oh, I'm sorry. It made my screen huge and I can't read my thing. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, good afternoon, Chairwoman Pennegrass, Vice Chairman Pena Melnick, and members of the Health and Government Affairs Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in opposition to House Bill 1013. I'm Lisa Van Buskirk, the leader of Start School Leaders Maryland and Arona County chapters. My written testimony contains additional comments and enclosures, including historic Baltimore Sun articles on permanent daylight savings time. I acknowledge the negative health and social impact society bears when we switch from standard time to daylight savings time this coming Sunday. The very day of the 2020 Senate bill hearing, the Wall Street Journal published a story about the negative effects of switching back and forth and the call by circadian scientists to move to permanent standard time and do away with daylight savings time, the complete opposite of this proposed legislation. Permanent daylight savings time combined with the current two early high school start times would have an even greater impact on adolescent circadian rhythm, safety, health, and academics. When Massachusetts studied the daylight savings time issue in 2017, their report made two caveats to the implementation of what they called Atlantic time, community education and later school start times. The latest sunrise of the year in Maryland occurs in December through January, which would be at about 8.30 a.m. under permanent DST. I took the liberty of comparing winter sunrise to school start times across Maryland. As you can see in the graphic in my written testimony, nearly all middle and high schools plus a fair number of elementary schools would start before sunrise, some more than an hour beforehand. It's not just the school bell we ought to consider, but the fact that so many more Maryland students will be picked up by a bus or walk to school in the dark during the winter relative to standard time. This is a safety issue. As the Massachusetts report acknowledged, one way to avoid the downside of year-round DST for school-aged children would be to delay school start times until there is sufficient daylight for safe travel. Many Maryland students ride buses for an hour, plus having to be at bus stop 10 minutes early and arriving 15 to 30 minutes at their school before the bell. We must take into account the impact of permanent daylight savings time on the darkness of their commute plus school start time. In January 1974, when the whole nation moved to permanent DST, two Maryland school systems delayed their school start times by 30 minutes to ensure students' safety. Keep in mind though, that schools in 1974 started much later than they do now, and permanent DST was, re was repealed within months. Please report unfavorably on House Bill 1013 or amend the bill to include a mandate for a minimum safe, healthy, and age-appropriate school hours for all students. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Diane Shackleforth. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, okay. Hi, um, thank you for having me here. It's an honor to be here. Uh, my name is Diane Shackelford and I'm representing um, Safe Standard Time, which is a nonprofit working throughout North America to end clock change and end the observance of daylight savings time for optimum health and safety. I ask that you oppose HB 1013 and, and until it's amended to permanent standard time. Now, the clock changes are unpopular and dangerous and ending them is wise but seeking permanent daylight saving time is not safe. The medical and scientific communities tell us that lack of exposure to morning light and increased exposure to evening light confuses our body clocks and leads us into sleep deprivation. The result is an increased risk for diabetes, obesity, heart disease, depression, and some forms of cancer. If on DST in the winter, Maryland sunrise would be as late as 8.39 a.m. You'd be leaving your home and arriving at work in the dark for over three months each year. It would negate the benefit of later school start times, and it would force school children to wait at bus stops in the dark on cold winter mornings. As a mother, I can tell you that I've spent years of mornings at dark bus stops because of daylight savings time. It's unsafe for children or anyone to stand on the side of the road in the dark while sleep deprived commuters drive by. Standard time would make this better. Daylight saving time makes it worse. In summary, I ask that you oppose HB 1013 and I ask that you move forward with ending clock change by instead opting for permanent standard time, which is pre-approved under federal law. Permanent standard time is recommended by the Maryland Sleep Society, the National PTA, 
the National Safety Council, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, and many more organizations. I appreciate your allowing me to speak and thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Um, questions for this panel? Questions from the committee? I have a question, uh, Ms. Shackelford. So you've been working on this, um, the standard time issue for a while. Are you seeing any movement at the federal level around this issue? Um, as far as I know, there are a, two or three bills pending right now at the federal level. One was just reintroduced. Um, and they are trying to push for um, daylight savings time for the most part. So oh, okay. we're, we're struggling with um, that legislation as well because it's unsafe. Some, some states would have sunrises as late as 9.48 a.m. On, on daylight savings time. Now, your state is not <laughs> quite that far west in the time zone, but some states would have a really harsh impact with that if it went nationwide. Okay, thank you. Uh, Delegate Lewis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Hope you guys can hear me and use my phone. We can. Um, thank you. Thank you to the delegate, uh, the bill sponsor, and to the panelists. I'm curious. Um, it's easy to be to feel persuaded by you know the Pediatric Association and national PTAs, and I'm just wondering uh, if we stayed on standard time, what would that look like in the spring and the winter? And whoever's best position to answer that, because I honestly don't know the difference. All I know is it's clocks change. I don't know which is standard and which is daylight and what. So if we stay it in standard time, what would spring look like and what would winter look like? Whoever's best to answer. I'm gonna look to Ms. Shackelford for that because she's been studying it and working on it for sure. Time. So the winter would be exactly the same as it is because you're already on standard time during the winter. So nothing changes there. Um, in, in the spring and fall, then your, your sunset would be an, an hour earlier than it is on, um, on daylight saving time, but your sunrise would also be an hour earlier. So, so right now we're on, we, we're, we would be, if we went to standard time as you, as, as the pediatricians and the PTAs are suggesting. Yes. What we see right now, this would be normal. We, sunrise at 6.30, sunset or it would be exactly like it is now. We just wouldn't change clocks on Sunday. And then in the summer, we would have still have 12 hour days at the equinox, right? You would have, I, I believe Maryland gets 14 or 15 hours of daylight in the summer. I mean, your, your sun your sun sets will still get later as the season progresses. It just won't be as late as it was before. So I, I don't remember offhand what your latest sunrise, your sunset is now, but it would be an hour earlier. And then the winter time when the kids are waiting for the bus in December, they would still be in the dark unless we change the school time, start start time. To it's going to depend on your start times. Um, you would still have sunsets, I mean, sunrises, excuse me, in the mornings, some of them after 7.30 for a short time in the winter, um, but it, it would never be at 8.30, um, which would capture a lot more people at school bus stops. So sticking with standard time would make Everything would be mostly the same, but that depth of winter, really long darkness, that wouldn't be as, as long as bad. That's the real bad I'm hearing. It wouldn't be as bad in the morning. I mean, right. you're still going to have early sunsets during the wintertime. Then you, you can't change how many right. hours of sunlight you have. Yeah. <laughs> the planets are where they are. Yeah. Thank right. You. Thank you so much. Thank you for helping understand. Yeah, you're Thank welcome. You. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate. Um, Seeing no further questions from the committee, we thank Delegate Crosby for bringing us the bill and the witnesses for their time and testimony. That completes the hearing on HB 1013. Um, committee, we have two more bills to do. We are going to take a break now. Our break will be slightly shorter in that we, it is now 320. We will return at 345 um, to complete the last two bills before we go back on the floor. So thank you all. We will see you in about 25 minutes.
Uh, Jamie? Yes. Jamie? I want to just ask, can I leave and then come back in at 345 or should I just stay when I'm a witness? You um, come back. Just come, just sign out and come back on. Well, no, to Robert, just sign out and come back, but make sure you come back a few minutes before 345 so Melissa Jamie. can see you, okay? It's yeah. a trick. It's a trick, Bob. You sign out, they're not going to let you back. <laughs> well, you know, there's a reason why you're not in charge. You know that, don't you? Uh, yeah, but I'm running the meetings today, Bob. So, oh, that's uh, well, right. Yeah. <laughs> that's I'm, right. I know I'm in good. I know right. I'm in good. I'm in, in trouble I'm there. In 45 or so, I just stay when I'm a witness. Yeah. So, and, and, I, and I know that I know that you've all missed me terribly. Come back on. Well, particularly the vice chairman of this come back, but make sure you come back a few minutes before 345 so Melissa can see you. Okay? Yeah. It's, okay. A trick. it's a trick, Bob. It's time now. They're not going to let you back. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there's a reason why you're not in charge. You know that, don't you? Uh, yeah, but I'm running the meeting soon.
discussing one, two. There's my friend Bob. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. Listen, you Bob, I really am. <laughs> uh, you know, it's amazing. What a year! You know, it's yeah. just my thirty. My, it's my thirty-six year of doing this. I've never seen anything like it. Back through the terms yeah. of four different governors. You know, four different speakers. I mean, it's just it's it's insane. I'm well. You it's know? Bob, you are yeah. on YouTube. You realize yeah. oh, right. you are live uh, on YouTube. 
I just noticed that. Just so. reminding you. So, sorry, um, Ms. Charles. We'll we'll um, we'll stop. We'll, you won't say any more. <laughs> yeah, we'll catch up offline. <laughs> we will. I'm, yes. I'm going to try to come down maybe this evening. I haven't been down. I've been down once the whole session. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, uh We've we've been down more than that. We're going back on the floor at five thirty. So I know. I know. Yeah. yeah. I know. Um, How's Marsha? All right. Good. Good. And it's three forty-five, so we can start our meeting. Um, do I have, let's see, we're going to go, uh, stay live and say, welcome back to the health and government operations committee. And we are going to begin with house bill 1078 delegate Terrassa attorney general climate change actions authorization delegate Terrassa. Good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair and Vice Chairman and members of the Health and Government Operation Committee. Thank you for this opportunity to present House Bill 1078. For the record, I'm Delegate Jen Terrassa. The climate emergency we find ourselves in was created by decades of denial, deception, and disinformation by the fossil fuel industry. Internal industry documents show that fossil, the fossil fuel companies predicted as far back as 1960, the 1960s that their products would cause catastrophic climate impacts. Instead of disclosing what they knew, the industry deliberately misled the public, policymakers, and the media about the dangers of climate change in order to protect their profits. These companies didn't play fair, they violated state law, and now our communities are paying the price. Our communities are now facing existential threat from climate change. Sea level rise, increasing severe storms, flooding, and more frequently inten frequent intense heat waves threaten the public health and safety of our state's citizens and environment. And in the coming decades, thousands of Marylanders may be displaced from their homes, see their property destroyed, or lose their livelihoods. With more than 3,000 miles of shoreline and unique coastal wildlife, Maryland will be one of the states most affected by climate change. This legislation follows other nations, states, and jurisdictions in an emerging field of law that will help defend our future. Um, the Attorney General's Office has a long history of holding bad actors accountable for damage they caused to the people of Maryland. Just as tobacco, opioids, lead, asbestos, and other industries were held accountable, for their fraud and deception and the resulting harms they cause to communities, the fossil fuel industry must, be, must not be allowed to escape legal liability, liability and pass off the extraordinary costs of its, of its business with impunity. House Bill 1078 ensures the Attorney General has the resources to investigate and file any appropriate action against businesses whose tortious and unlawful conduct may have contributed to climate change at no additional cost to the state. Just a really quick note, I saw that um, MBIA and the Farm Bureau um, are, were concerned and I've been in contact with both of them to assure them that they're not the intended target of this legislation. Um, but we're happy to continue working with them and discuss possible clearing, clarifying language if necessary. I respectfully urge a favorable report and I'd like to cede the rest of my time to Jamie DeMarco. Great, uh, Jamie DeMarco, please. You're on mute. Uh, uh -oh. I apologize. There he is. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the members of the committee and thank you, Delegate Terrassa, for introducing this bill. My name is Jamie DeMarco. I am the Maryland Policy Director for the Chesapeake Climate Action Network. We urge a favorable report on HB 1078. Maryland is already paying the costs of climate change. Many of us remember on July 30th, 2016, residents of Ellicott City had to run up their stairs to escape the water that was ripping apart the first floor of their buildings and sending their cars careening down Main Street. It was a one in a thousand year rain event, we all said. Resilient as ever, Ellicott City built back, fixed the stores, bought new cars. Then on May 27th of 2018, a second once in a thousand year rain event gutted those same storefronts and sent those new cars careening down Main Street. Two once in a thousand rain events in less than 24 months. Ellicott City is the most dramatic example, but it's by no means the most costly. Folks on the Eastern shore have to pay 
their life savings to jack up their homes just a few feet. The city of Annapolis experienced more increased average annual nuisance flooding than any other city in the nation. And a recent study said that between now and 2040, Maryland will have to spend more than $27 billion protecting ourselves from sea level rise. $27 billion between now and 2040. That's an average of $1.4 billion every year. And sea level rise is just one of the many costs associated with the climate crisis. Where are we going to get that money? Without the ability to recover the costs from the fossil fuel industry itself that knew and lied about this crisis. They knew and they lied. We are going to have to either raise taxes or cut other services. 25 counties, cities, and states across the country, including Annapolis and Baltimore, have already filed lawsuits against the fossil fuel industry to recover the costs of these damages. And I will add, these are very straightforward cases. All these cases say is, your product had a deadly defect. You lied for decades about the deadly defect of that product, and now you need to pay for the damage that that deadly defect caused. Six attorney generals, including A.G. Racine of Washington, D.C. and Kathy Jennings of Delaware have also filed cases. And it's important to bring a statewide case. Holding bad actors to account is really resource and time intensive. Not everybody has the resources to pursue litigation on their own. And uh, my understanding is I have the two minutes. That was my original two minutes to finish my remarks. Yes. Thank you. And so many of the communities that need these funds the most are in municipalities without the resources to bring their own case. We know that climate change hits low-income communities and communities of color first and worst because of historical and current racism and inequities. But after bearing the brunt of this crisis, some of these communities are put at a disadvantage when it comes to receiving the funds necessary to recover. We need a statewide case to make sure every Marylander has access to the funds to cover the costs incurred by the climate crisis. Now, I wanna briefly go over what this bill does and does not do. HB 1078 simply authorizes the Attorney General to hire outside counsel on a contingency fee basis to bring a suit. And it requires a contingency basis to make sure there is no cost to taxpayers. HB 1078 reasserts the power of the Attorney General to hold accountable the bad actors whose tortious or unlawful actions contributed to the climate crisis. In other words, this is narrowly focused on companies that violated the law. The emphasis is on the law breaking. Just buying and selling fossil fuels will not bring you a suit. You have to have engaged in tortious and unlawful activity, such as knowingly lying about the climate crisis. The American Petroleum Institute and other big actors like Exxon had their own scientists confirm the reality of climate change and then spent billions over decades denying and deceiving the public and stopping action on climate change. That is the crime we're going after. If you're just a business that buys fossil fuels or even just a business that sells fossil fuels, this is not about you. You're off the hook. Congratulations, I'm really happy for you. We, there's no suit that's gonna be about you. This is a really important bill. It would bring important focused litigation at no cost to the state and we urge a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah Gross. Sarah Gross. Are you on mute, Sarah? No, nope, you're there. Uh, am I here? All right, excellent. Here. Okay. Thank you. And thank you to everyone for considering um, this bill and my testimony. Um, my name is Sarah Gross. I'm the chief of the Affirmative Litigation Division of the Baltimore City Department of Law, and I am the in-house counsel for the city of Baltimore <laughs> our lawsuit um, against the fossil fuel industry, which was brought in 2018. Uh, we brought this lawsuit because of the harmful effects of climate change, many of which have been outlined already, um, including the rising sea levels and increased participation, which has caused widespread and unprecedented flooding, both in Baltimore and other areas. Um, as you may have noticed, we've had significant flooding in the Inner Harbor, uh, as well as flash flooding around the city. Uh, more than 6% of Baltimore City has been designated as high risk for flooding, and the sea level rise in Baltimore has increased the likelihood of extreme flooding by 20%. This uh, 
not only threatens the public health, but also threatens and property. It also, you know, threatens major industry in Baltimore because the port and the waterfront are very important uh, to us for both, you know, tourism and tax bases and providing jobs. Um, and as been said, the harm has not just been limited to Baltimore City. Recent years have seen extreme flooding across the state in Ellicott City, Annapolis. Um, a major study revealed that uh, the sea levels in the Chesapeake Bay have risen at twice the rate of the global average in the 20th century. So clearly, uh, the threats are not only current, but ongoing, um, both to the public health, to, to property. Um, and as has been discussed, um, oh, and I also wanted to add, a Smithsonian report last week uh, reported that climate change has caused the edible portions of oysters to shrink, which will have a significant impact on the state's oyster industry, particularly if it continues. The fossil fuel industries need to be accountable for this instead of putting the hook on the taxpayers. And we, we in the city are happy to support uh, the attorney general in pursuing their own case. Thank you. Um, Hannibal, uh, Hannibal uh, Kammerer. Thank you, Chair Collison, Vice Chair Pina Melnick, and distinguished members of the Health and uh, of the HGO Committee. Excuse me. Uh, my name is Hannibal Kemmer, and I'm Chief Counsel for Legislative Affairs to Attorney General Frosch. Uh, we are here to express our um, considerable support for a favorable report of House Bill 1078, Delegate Terrasa's bill to provide the Attorney General with the authority to sue fossil fuel companies for climate change harms that they've caused. Uh, fossil fuel companies have been marketing their products despite knowing that the earth is warming and that fossil fuels are an outsized reason for that warming. Uh, they've been doing so while casting doubt on climate science and they should be held accountable. As uh, both Delegate Terrasa and uh, Mr. DeMarco said, a number of states, municipalities, and cities have already brought actions. Um, they include Delaware, Rhode Island, Hawaii, Minnesota, uh, and with respect to cities, it's Baltimore, Annapolis, Hoboken, New York, Honolulu, Hawaii, New York, New York, Oakland, uh, California. Uh, and with regard to municipalities, they include Boulder County, Colorado, uh, the County of Maui, Hawaii, King County, Washington, uh, Santa Cruz County, California, and San Mateo County, California, just among others. We are, according to our Court of Appeals, uh, precluded from bringing suits like this under our parents' patrie or common law authority, and therefore uh, this bill becomes necessary. I look forward to um, answering questions that the committee may have and appreciate the opportunity to testify. We urge a favorable report on House Bill 1078. Thank you. Thank you. Are, are there questions for the sponsor or this favorable panel? Questions from the committee? I see Delegate Bagnell. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and, and thank you to, um, you know, thank you to the, the sponsor for, for this bill. Can you just speak to why it's important to have a, a statewide case? Yeah, I think it, uh, Mr. DeMarco or Mr. Kemmerer, um, which one of you would like to um, address that? I know only one of us can. <laughs> Thank you for remembering that, Delegate. <laughs> <laughs> I'll yield to Mr. DeMarco. Um, yeah, thank you for that question, Delegate Bagnall. Really appreciate it. A statewide case is really important because, like I said in my opening testimony, not every municipality necessarily has the resources to bring a case even on a contingency fee basis. So if there are counties uh, maybe on the Eastern shore that are facing a lot of sea level rise and actual displacement of communities, they may not have the resources to, you know, these are really time intensive court cases. The, the fossil fuel industry is throwing all of their massive resources and lots of bad faith arguments at throwing these court cases out and it's not easy. And so on behalf of all of the Marylanders who don't um, have the great honor of living somewhere wonderful like Baltimore City or Annapolis that are lucky enough to have the resources to bring this case, we want a case brought on behalf of all Marylanders. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Delegate Hill. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, um, uh, Delegate Tarasa, for bringing this bill. I think Mr. DeMarco, since... Uh, 
you are the best person to answer the question. Um, I know we sort of have this habit or this this tendency here in America to say if somebody money by screwing other folks, that's just the you know that's the cost of doing business, and they're not supposed to, you know, we're just supposed to say bygones that you know they 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 did it and they should be able to get away with it. I, I'm really curious, what exactly is it that you think, or that you have evidence of that the fossil fuel companies knew um, that you know if if this goes through and we do bring a lawsuit, what do you think we're gonna disclose or discover? Thank you so much, Delegate, for asking that question. That is a really, really important question. And luckily, there have been lawsuits that have gone before that have actually discovered the documents that found the damning reports. And I actually have a binder here that is oh. full of everything they knew. Is that a binder of women? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a binder full of lies. And this is the second binder. There's two binders full of what they knew. Um, and I have some highlights that I keep in a, a digital document. But for example, in 1977, this is a presentation that James Black gave to Exxon, where they said, one recent study predicts that in 2075, CO2 concentrations will peak at about twice their considered normal level. What is considered best presently available climate model for treating the greenhouse gas effect predicts that a doubling of the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere would produce a mean temperature increase of two to three degrees Celsius over most of the earth. That's like a, about as sophisticated as knowledge as we have today. They knew in 1977. In that same presentation, James says, current scientific opinion overwhelmingly favor favors attributing atmospheric carbon dioxide increase to fossil fuel combustion. Wow. And, and then he goes on to say, with a warmer climate around the world, it seems fairly certain that precipitation would increase. So they were predicting these increased precipitation events in 1977 and okay. presenting it internally, then turning around and lying to the public. Uh, okay. so they, they knew what would happen to Ellicott City, they just lied. So this is, thank you, Madam Chair, it sounds like it's at least as bad as Purdue and the opioid epidemic, thank you. Thank you, Delegate. Delegate Rosenberg. Does the Attorney General need this statute, need this law to bring such an action? And if so, what are the benefits of having the statute once such an action is brought? Uh, yes, thank you, Delegate uh, Rosenberg. As, as indicated in my uh, written testimony, we don't have this authority uh, under our common law in Maryland. And so without the General Assembly or permission from the governor, uh, we could not bring these. Uh, cases. Yes, are. <laughs> I sent letters. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions? Uh, Chairman Pendergrass. Chairman Pendergrass, are you on mute? There you go. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, I make the same mistake we all do. Um, <laughs> Mr. Kemmerer, I'm a little confused and we're gonna ask for an AG's opinion about this. I don't, I, I mean, I'm not a lawyer, let's start there. So common law is one thing, but we passed a bill some years ago giving the attorney general the to bring lawsuits without being directed by the General Assembly or the governor. So I'm wondering why this doesn't fall within that law that we passed some, maybe five years ago, maybe nine years ago, I can't remember, or eight, seven maybe. Thank you, Chairman per Chair Prendergrass. Um, it's true that the General Assembly did give uh, the Attorney General authority to challenge federal administration. Uh, conduct, but not uh -huh. private conduct. So while while that bill was very much appreciated and used to great effect, um, it would not have, it would, it still would not uh, permit us to go after the fossil fuel industry in this way. Thank you very much. That explains it. My pleasure. Uh, Delegate Krebs. Thank you. Um, Hannibal, you just, just the question came to mind. If, if what this business is doing is legal, and I, I'm talking about, um, I think the uh, Car safe, Service Station Repair Association weighed in and they're, they're selling gasoline. And obviously gasoline is, has emissions and they're selling it. It's a legal thing that they're doing. H how would this play out if the, if the business is doing something legal and then they come in and say, oh, but you can't do that because, how, how do you find that balance? Thank you, Delegate Krebs, my delegate. Uh, it's a pleasure to answer that question. So. 
the bill uh, uses predicate language like deceptive, you know, conduct, harmful conduct that's like knowingly harmful or committing fraud. So if somebody owns a, a service station and they're merely, merely selling gas that they purchased from one of the majors or something, that's not what we're aiming to get at. We're aiming to get at the disinformation that comes from, you know, API or uh, the major, the major uh, oil and gas fossil fuel companies um, when they sort of precipitate this notion that fossil fuels do not uh, harm the climate. Okay, I'm, I'm just looking for an example of something local like a Maryland, not API, because that's more federal, but is there an example of like a Maryland business that you right now, if you if you had this authority tomorrow, what in time would you have to go after? You know, uh, I can't I can't say off the top of my head uh, that we would go after any specific Maryland business. What I can say is that if given this authority, the attorney the attorney general will um, engage potential outside counsel on a contingency fee basis. They would in turn investigate, uh, utilizing some of the docket. We'd probably go start in uh, Mr. DeMarco's binders, um, but no, they would investigate. Uh, what the conduct of the fossil fuel industry has been up to, and if we found adequate cause to bring state or federal uh, common law or tortious claims, we would pursue those claims at that time. Uh, but we don't have any sort of preconceived uh, notions of liability, and we don't have any um, specific, uh, you know, defendants in mind. It would be where the facts and law led us. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to move to a panel of unfavorable and we'll start with Colby Ferguson. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, Colby Ferguson on behalf of Maryland Farm Bureau. And um, I, I don't, we don't really come in opposition of what the intent of this bill and what you've uh, listened to as far as the discussion. Um, we're really coming uh, opposition of the unintended consequences that could come from, uh, from a bill like this. Um, the discussion has been about the fossil fuel industry, but um, as we all know, fossil fuels are not the only emitters of carbon and uh, greenhouse gases. And as things move forward in a in a uh, in a new administration, um, I all I got to do is look at a couple years ago the uh, the introduction of the new Green Deal, uh, which I affectionately have my background with uh, dairy cows uh, to show that within the new new Green Deal, they talked about cows and uh, flatulation and creating a methane and, and if all of a sudden now uh, creating creation of methane was considered the dairy farmer in act or not doing an action or an inaction uh, to capture that or, or prevent that if that all of a sudden became considered illegal now this would give the give the authority to the attorney general to start suing our dairy farmers and uh, that's how broad this bill is and that's why we come uh, a little bit uh, into it. I would also recommend that um, there is another bill that's out uh, that the Attorney General actually introduced. It's House Bill 739 that's in Environment and Transportation uh, that gives, it gives the Attorney General uh, the authority to, um, to settle out of court in a, at a smaller level. Uh, what we believe is the ability to cast a wider net uh, to uh, individuals that they would take under a, under a case. And in, in our our thoughts are is that uh, to cash flow a larger case. And our real worry is, is that the unintended consequences that a bill like this would have. And so we would greatly appreciate some sort of narrowly focusing to go to the true intent uh, if it's to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Robert Etten. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman, members of the committee, Robert Etten on behalf of the Maryland uh, Building Industry Association. It's good to see all of you. I haven't been in your committee uh, yet this, this year, or I haven't been in Annapolis very much. Um, uh, we are signed up in opposition, but we have met with the sponsor of the bill. And just as the gentleman on behalf of the farming community testified, the builders have the same concern. Um, uh, you know, if we buy a product that uh, was manufactured uh, or, uh, or sold by um, uh, uh, someone that's violated the law, uh, the way we read the bill, we could be held, uh, uh, we could be prosecuted and sued uh, under the bill. Uh, the sponsors indicated that that's not her intention, and uh, we're going to work on amendments uh, along with the Farm Bureau to make it clear that we're not um, subject to the provisions of this bill. We're not fossil 
fuel sellers or manufacturers or distributors. So with that, with those amendments were adopted, we would be okay with the bill. Thank you. Thank and could you. I be excused? I'm being called in JPR to testify as we speak. Yes, go, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, uh, Mr. Vince McAvoy. Yes, hello committee. Thank you so much. Um, can, I'm, I'm hopeful that you can hear me all right. Um, I'm against this bill and I, I want to state that uh, we, we heard cities of Baltimore and Ellicott City brought up. Um, if we're talking about flooding, I, I wonder if we're talking about the 10 to 12, 12 million, sorry, 12 million gallons of raw sewage that gets pumped into the inner harbor, raising water level there, or the fact that zoning in Ellicott City, I'm not sure that everyone has been by Ellicott City, I used to dine there, um, knows that that particular part where we're looking, it's at the bottom of a hill. Um, I wonder if, if city planners had anything to do with that. Um, also, 60% um, of the energy that we get in Maryland right now is generated by coal. Now, I'm not for pollution. I actually used to work for the solar energy uh, plant. We only had one in the state, and uh, we got rid of it about a decade ago, which is unfortunate because we had our own technology there to make our own solar panels. We made it from scratch right here in Maryland. I did that. So I'm for keeping a clean environment, but getting Brian Frosch and the attorney general involved with any of this is, is kind of nonsense because we're all to blame. We all use that energy. Uh, we're all contributing to this when we gas up our cars and we turn on lights. Uh, 60 to 70 percent of your energy uh, that is used in the residence, I'm not going to get into commercial and transportation, but just in your residence, 70 percent of that is for lighting and for air conditioning and heating. Right, we're, we're all to blame. We all have something to do with this. And, and honestly, this bill could very easily get carried away. You're going to have lack of scope, especially if these move into class action. I urge an unfavorable. This is the wrong approach to things. Let's point the mirror at ourselves and let's make things cleaner ourselves without using the courts and regulatory agencies. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Um, uh, committee, if you have questions for Mr. Ferguson or Mr. Vacavoy, if you have questions for Mr. Benton, please uh, talk to him, uh, reach him offline. But now we're open for questions for the two remaining panelists. Are there any questions? Okay, seeing none, that concludes the hearing on HB 10. 78. Uh, thank you, Delegate Terrassa. Thank you to the witnesses for your time and testimony today. We will move to the next bill, which is House Bill, wait a minute, um, 1129. Uh, this is Delegate Krim, and it's Department of Information Technology, State and Local Government Employees and Contractors Cybersecurity Training. Delegate Krim. Thank you, Madam Chair. So it's good to see you and the members of this committee. I don't think I've been here this year yet. So HB 1129 implements one of the chief recommendations of the Joint Committee on Cybersecurity, Information Technology, and Biotechnology to create a statewide cybersecurity training apparatus. And I just want to use a little bit of my time, maybe a minute, to tell you how, how I got here, because I'm not a tech person. Um, I really don't have any background in, in this technology. But I was working on telework, and that's my bill. And we, as a general or House of Delegates, passed that bill last week. And when I started working on telework, I started taking uh, some online courses on telework, some webinars, and I learned that there's two things that we need if we're going to expand telework. And one was broadband across the state, and one was cybersecurity. And I did a broadband bill, and now this is the cybersecurity bill. And what I learned uh, in the webinar that the people who use your computers, the state 
infrastructure, so to speak. It could be from state and local government. It could be in the private sector because we do uh, contract work with people in the private sector and they use our computers to bid on projects through procurement. And I learned that malware, ransomware, hackers, all of those things can come from any one of those sources and infect your infrastructure. And then here we are in a situation like Baltimore City had last year, uh, Baltimore County Public Schools had, where your whole infrastructure goes down and then you can't do, you can't do work. You, you are non-productive and it costs you tens of millions of dollars to resolve what these outside forces have done to your infrastructure. So the bill requires the Department of Information Technology in coordination with the Maryland Cybersecurity Council to develop criteria for the certification of varied cybersecurity training programs used by state and local government employees. The certification criteria would focus on forming information security habits to protect information resources, personal information, and records. The bill mandates do it, our Department of Information Technology, to certify and maintain a list of training programs. Mm -hmm. uh, the, um, the Senate has a cross file on this. Uh, I brought my bill to the Joint Committee on cybersecurity. And uh, when they reviewed my bill, they supported it. And then uh, Katie Fry Hester, Senator Fry Hester, and now Senator Jackson, who was the House chair when he was a delegate at that time, they are sponsoring the bill in the Senate. So uh, the Joint Committee felt it was that important that we have a coordinated training program across the state for everybody who uses state computers because we are under tremendous pressure now from these outside forces that want to hack in to our system. They spend the day trying to figure out how to do that. And, our, and people who use the state computer systems are the first line of defense. We have to train them to be able to spot these nefarious actors and to spot what would be something that would cause problems in our infrastructure. It's our responsibility to protect it. So, uh, so that's the bill. Uh, as I said, the Senate has a cross file. Uh, they had their hearing last week. Uh, you do have an amendment from uh, somebody in the private sector, which I agree to sponsor as part of this bill. Uh, that would allow the private sector to present their training program to the states, do it, and then they can certify it. Uh, so, and I, I agree that that would be fine. They don't have to use one of our training programs. If they have one that can comply, then, um, then do it can, can certify it. Um, the MML and MAKO have some objections also. They do acknowledge that we need to do something here. They acknowledge that this is important, but I think they would like to do the same thing the private sector is suggesting. So um, I think they will offer you testimony on that. But that's the bill. It's a coordinated cybersecurity program, training program for everybody who uses state computers. Thank you, Delegate. Mm -hmm. uh, are there questions for um, Delegate Krim? Questions from the committee. Uh, you've been very comprehensive, Delegate. I see no questions. Super. So I'm gonna call um, an unfavorable panel, which it begins with Drew um, Jabin. Hi, um, 
Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, for the record, Drew Jabin here on behalf of the Maryland Association of Counties, in respectful opposition to House Bill 1129 as written. As always, you have my written testimony. I will keep it brief. I'd just like to make a few points. Local jurisdictions are extremely inclined to collaborate and partner with all appropriate state agencies in the shared goal of having robust cybersecurity operations. Um, county IT officials are already under the executive authority of their elected officials. They already have robust cybersecurity operations. And that means that we're already meeting the spirit of this particular legislation. So as written, House Bill 1129 does not contain any hint of local input, which is a huge concern, along with the potential for significant fiscal impacts on local government as stated in the fiscal note. So again, I'd like to make it extremely clear that we're not here opposing the idea of increased cybersecurity training, resources, or guidance, but this bill in particular we're opposing specifically because it overrides local autonomy on how to best implement the cybersecurity training programs. Um, most local jurisdictions are currently using no before for cybersecurity training, but under this bill, uh, do it is the entity that's tasked with determining what programs will fill the allotted 20 slots without deference to what is already successful locally. So while we're here in opposition on this bill as written, we're extremely happy to work with the committee on figuring out how to best um, address the goal of increased cyber resources statewide without being overly prescriptive and without giving up proper local flexibility and input. So thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Justin Fiore. Yes, good afternoon, Madam Chair, committee members. For the record, my name is Justin Fiore, and I'm here on behalf of Maryland Municipal League in opposition to House Bill 1129. Uh, like Je uh, Drew said, you have a written testimony. I'm just going to share an analogy that I also provided the Senate work group on cybersecurity issues, which is led by Senator Hester. You know, whenever you're designing a security system, whether it's physical or cyber, you do it based on risk, which is why your local pet shop doesn't have the same security system as your local bank. And because of the kinds of services that our members provide and the type of data our members collect, we're more like the pet shop than the bank in this argument. Um, smaller jurisdictions might contract for trash and recycling. They'll host a website where they might have some permitting applications, and then they maintain their roads. Uh, many of them don't have water or, a water or sewer plant. Uh, they don't run an electrical grid. They don't have other high value infrastructure that uh, hackers might target. And then further, this was pointed out by Senator Riley, who's also in that work group and kind of understands where we're coming from here, um, is that our members are more siloed than state agencies or even the counties. If someone hacks a municipal cloud server, they won't have access to the state system. There's a buffer there. We're not generally operating on state systems. Um, so as you heard in an earlier bill from us, MML supports efforts that will help bolster cybersecurity infrastructure and the best practices that municipal officials and staff operate under. But House Bill 1129 is a broad one size fits all approach to a much more nuanced discussion on risk and cybersecurity needs. For that reason, we respectfully request an unfavorable report on House Bill 1129. Thank you very much. Um, questions for this panel, uh, Delegate Lewis Young. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Delegate Krim made a reference to an amendment that she accepted, which essentially says that the private sector could submit their own training program for approval. So I would like to address a question to either one of the representatives from local government to see if you would be amenable to Admitting a similar amendment um, that would discuss your customized training program. Because I heard from both of you that you approved of the concept, but you just wanted to tailor your training more to your needs. So I can only speak for MAKO. I mean, we're definitely happy to submit amendments. I'm happy to work with the sponsor or the committee. Um, but yes, I, I would say we are definitely willing to work with you all to further the goal. Thank you. Any further questions from the committee? Okay. All right. 
Um, seeing no further questions, that concludes the bill hearing on HB 1129 and the work before us today. Thank you to the delegate and the panel, the witnesses for coming and uh, providing us with their time and their testimony today. Uh, we will be happy.